Hello, and welcome to another episode of Traeger Method Oil Painting. Today we're going to be looking at this small square painting. It's a work on panel piece of masonite to be precise. playing that sort of spooky blues. Something I made up at the end of a music session the other night, just wanted to change the groove there at the end and came up with that. Making songs is very similar to making music in terms of the cycle of process. An idea starts with a germ, some little chord sequence, or just a, a few notes together inspire a melody that inspires a set of chords that inspires a response and a bridge when a chorus, whole thing gets refined. Painting starts with a couple marks, this big splash, whatever. Then as you work on it, it gets more refined. I've been uh, focusing equally on music and painting in recent weeks, months, I should say, maybe. In the pandemic era. Music has come back into the uh, forefront again, shares the space with painting. Last few days I've been back at painting full, full time. And up until last couple days, I was working pretty much when I was painting, I was working on my bigger canvases, the ones that are kind of in the four, five foot, six foot, seven foot range. Large canvases in my world. So it's been nice to get back to these, this, this series I have of these small um, panel paintings. get into the detail work. Paint acts differently, of course, on a hard, me uh, what do you call it? I was gonna say medium, but that's not it. That's, um, you can call it the surface. You can call it the support. That's the word I was looking for. The support. The canvas is the support. The panel is the support in the case of this painting. <clears throat> I don't have an exact number, but I have something in the, in the neighborhood of 13 or 14, anywhere between 13 and 16 of these square paintings. They're primarily covering old acrylic experiments from years ago. I took only the basic design that was included in those paintings and uh, 
completely covered them over in my in the past year with what you're seeing emerging now. These paintings, more than any of my other work, are inspired by early oil painting masters, the, the uh, Northern Renaissance style of painting, hard-edged, imagined scenes rendered realistically, but sorry about that. I should edit out those, those big camera wiggles. I'm going to stop this for a second just to check and see we're at the six minute, you know, something like that. Seven minute mark. I've had this issue in the past where I've done these recordings and I find that, uh, it's stopping maybe when there's too much silence. I can't figure out exactly what it is. I, I need to take the time to just find out what that is, um, which actually reminds me of another thing I want to talk about. But um, yeah, uh, so anyways, it just tends to shut off or something because then because I'll, I'll narrate like a large section of one of these things and then I'll go back and listen and it'll be like much shorter than I recorded and I'm going and then they don't line up. I'll, I'll mention something on in the video and it won't be lined up anymore. And so it's something I need to resolve. I'm sure YouTube will teach me, but let me double check right now that that's happened. Okay. It appears to be working. I'm going to turn up the volume a little. It seemed kind of low. Pump that up. Maybe boost the uh, the gain. Put some low end on it. Could try to crank the low end a little. Still not 100% sure what's happening with the laptop mixer situation. I'm hearing a slight echo and that's and a, just a hint of feedback. Just a hint, but not, not enough to make me stop and, and deal with it. I'm just going to roll with it. So like I was saying, these paintings, these uh, panel paintings, I have bigger ones too, but uh, there is this particular series that I'm, I'm working on. They're heavily influenced by that Northern Renaissance style. Painters to look at that I'm talking about, Jan van Eyck, Roger Campine, Roger van der Weyden, Hieronymus Bosch, Hans Peter Bruegel, the older, the younger, the um, Lucas Cronach, the studio Cronach. Watched a uh, YouTube, a documentary, BBC, or something about the Cronach studio. C-R-A-N-A-C-H. If you don't, if you're not into that stuff, you don't know about it. Get into it. Those paintings are incredible. I've uh, seen work by all the great masters in person. And they're incredible to behold. It's amazing that... Uh, it's an art form painting that there's no linear progress to it. I mean, nobody can create paintings as good as those now, like those. Maybe they can, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like it. I love working on these kind of paintings. The, I mean, this, these, these small ones and this detail work, it's, it's my favorite. It's so fun. I was thinking about these uh, these small wood paintings. 
um, about how they have a kind of almost enamel feel to me, more so than canvas. The medium I use has a slightly glossy texture. And when you work on a hard surface like a uh, panel, you get this, um, that's probably why there's a lot of glare. I'm sorry for that. I'm going to try and, that's another thing I really need to get a handle on is like good lighting, good video production so that it's nice and flat. I, I, it's coming. It is. I want to make this frustrating early work, warts and all. And then I'll refine it as we go. I'm not in a place where I'm looking for, you know, obstacles or reasons not to release things. So I'm talking into the thing while I point as though I'm not going to be speeding these things up. So I don't know what I'm saying there. Again, when I paint, I don't look you know, you look while you paint. So you don't have to spend a ton of time just staring at your painting. You know, a lot of people will spend a ton of time just staring. And I think, well, you know, you look while you work. And it's one of many. I've got a whole bunch of them. There's another one. One over there. I got some pieces on uh, paper. This one's on paper. That one's on paper. These are all my smaller ones that are in play right now. Got this whole bunch. These are all little panel paintings. They're kind of at a similar state of completion. A few more down here. I like that one. This is a small one on paper. Another. Some canvas ones back there place right now where I want to finish some painting. So like with this one, I go, okay, it's, it's like I said, with many of these other ones, they're all at this similar place. And essentially, I just want to like wrap it up. So I'm thinking like, okay, these figures, wh what is this? Where is this in relation to this? Is this in the foreground background? Doesn't make any sense. Has to be decided. Uh, why is this leaf turned in? You know, essentially at this point, uh, I've been working a lot on details, you know, little details and stuff, but I really need to figure out some bigger points, you know, like the foreground background, what's this background about, and just check and see. And start thinking creatively again too, you know, this is kind of a blank in some ways. A lot of my paintings, you know, they're, they go in stages of, of detail. And like, for instance, this, this egg sitting in this gel type thing, I want to, you know, like what goes around it? Like that's next, you know, the real, the thing that makes things come to life. Is there fruit hanging off this branch? Le more leaves, silhouettes of leaves. Where does that branch go? This tape coming out of that slot. These figures kind of emerging from the mist have some walking out of the mist into clarity out here, you know, create the, the space that this is happening and reconfirm it. Yeah, so that was a little studio tour. I keep a lot of paintings in rotation. I, I, in these, in these uh, videos, I repeat myself a lot. That's just how it is. So, talk a lot about the rotation, circular rotation, like a merry-go-round. Picture like a merry-go-round. 
or several merry-go-rounds, interlocking Venn diagram merry-go-rounds. You know, have this series of small panel paintings. They're rotating in and out. I'll do a week where I just work on them. You know, my these my medium, Daniel Smith oil painting medium for, no, medium for oils and alkyds. It dries the way I paint thinly on these these panels. Did I finish that thought earlier about how they're kind of glassy, jewel-like, enamel-like, these panel paintings? Something I wanted to get across for some reason. I was thinking about that, that aspect of them. Something you notice when you see the, the, that work of the old masters in person. The paint seems to, you know, it's, it, it, there's a definition, that hard edged, see that kind of stuff I'm doing right there, that those like, you know, where you kind of almost, you have a plan of how to execute. I was thinking about in those painting studios, you know, a lot of those guys didn't do all the parts on their paintings or, or some of them didn't. You know, they'd have a studio where they would teach you exactly how to do hands and exactly how to paint trees and exactly how to do flowers and what plants to paint and how to paint them and what colors to use to paint them. So, you know, it's kind of like a Photoshop or something. Put that in there, put the sky up there, put this in there, then I'll come in and do the face, you know, and, you know, I'll do the composition and I'll do the final touches. But you guys will do all the rest and your specialty parts. And that's that's a, an asp a style of painting that I um, I like and I admire it and I feel like that's something I want to do because, you know, when you go in to do like this detail work, it's good to have references. I mean, you know, a plant, there's a million weeds and plants and I go, I walk around in my neighborhood and I'll see in any given walk just coming through the sidewalk cracks, you know, I'll see a thousand plants, totally different rhythms, all this stuff. Which ones do I include? You know, which ones do I particularly like? Which ones work with the other, with another form perfectly, you know, and accent them. But have them figured out ahead of time or, or you know, have a, another thing you can do is use an image bank, you know, of, uh, I got the iPad on a um, stand and I'll have, um, you know, a photo library available to me. I don't, I rarely use that, but I, but I might, as I get into this finishing work, I think that's something I might bring back. Um, you know, just for extra added in, uh, inspiration. Cause plant forms are just, you know, always surprising and amazing. Like in this root work there. It reminds me of like children's illustration. I had this book growing up that was very, very influential on me called uh, The Big Golden Book of Elves and Fairies, uh, illustrated by Garth Williams. It's a collection of some poems and stories, all sort of dealing with the elf world. There's a little bit of mermaid stuff in there too, but the elf stuff and the fairy stuff is what really grabbed me. Cannery bear, that got in there too, a flying bear, but that's, well, that's the mermaid story too, so... Um, yeah, they snuck in some non-fairy, non-elf stuff, but it's adjacent. But anyways, that book, there's uh, some incredible illustrations. Well, many, I mean, the whole thing is just visually incredible. It's one amazing print job. It's got a very kind of, there's nighttime is a lot. There's a lot of night in it, a lot more than most children's books. A lot of night. And uh, it just had a deep, deep impact on my imagination. And and I see that work in, in what I'm doing there, um, in this piece. And that kind of rich, defined children's book illustration style of, of Garth Williams. And I'm trying to think of others who also share that that kind of vibe, but it's not coming to me right now. The Delares, or is that the name of them? It's like D apostrophe Alares. It's a couple. They did these books. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about. The uh, 
big, you know, the book of Greek myths, the group book of Norse mythology, that stuff. They did also did, you know, Ben Franklin, Abraham Lincoln. It's, uh, is it colored pencil? I think that they work with. I don't know, but those books also very deep psychic impact on me big time. Like my imagination went there and I know that work affects me. It's, you know, it, again, not conscious. It's not upfront. It's nothing that I look at or anything like that. It's just, it's just in me, you know, that's like an influence. It's just a part of my thinking when I'm doing this kind of representational imagination based work. That watermelon form, I might look at a watermelon, get a little more inspiration on the stripes, but you know, for it looks pretty watermelon-like. It reads like a watermelon. Gonna really dial in the translucent, the translucent work on this series. Because that's another thing that those Northern Renaissance and Renaissance, Renaissance painters were so good at was creating those scrims of milky, silky cloth. That's a nice shot. Good job. I try to stay out of the camera's way. But the milky, silky fabrics, scrims, differentiating a transparent or translucent scrim from a fog of light, differentiating that from a bright beam, um, color hue changes as transparent colors go over one another, translucent colors, that kind of stuff. You do it in glazes. When I work uh, in this, this cyclical, circular rotation style of working, which is how I work pretty much all the time, um, definitely all the time, um, you know, I will work on a painting sometimes for as much as an entire session, say 10, 12 hours or more, 14 at the most, eight would be average. I might work on it the entire time, but usually I'd work on two or three different things, maybe even rotate through four or five things, five or six things, just uh, work for a couple hours on some things. And sometimes I'll do a mix where I'll spend, you know, a vast majority of time working on one painting, doing detail work, putting in blades of grass, you know, uh, pearls or whatever. And then I'll spend, you know, hours and hours doing little detail work. And then I'll switch over to another painting and I'll just do a yellow glaze over the whole body of the, the object and maybe a purple glaze over the, the dark recess behind it. Just to add a layer of richness, you know, and then set it aside. It took me five minutes, you know, 10 minutes. And then you set it aside. That thing's going to be dry in a day or two, completely ready to work again. Then you go back in, add highlights, bright white, whitish kind of uh, light hue, I mean light, light uh, value, dull chroma, under bright chroma, chroma being intensity of hue, value being lightness. I'm working with that right there. You see, I'm putting in that branch. I'm doing an intensity and opacity to put the branch in front. You know, it's coming out. You put it in, you, you, you create, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, space, but with this kind of intensity, you create depth with it. And, you know, another thing about uh, this working style is that you're just constantly sort of pushing and pulling and you're putting in, you know, sort of more opaque things covered in with glazes and, and it creates this depth that can't be really achieved, I don't think, any other way. 
and I haven't studied, you know, the the master, the old masters, Jan Van Eyck's, you know, anything. I don't know that it's it's known, but I haven't studied it. Whatever, if it is known, um, you know, how how he worked or how that studio would produce a painting like that. What order things would be painted? I don't have strict uh, working orders or anything like that. Um, but it tends to be like a, I've maybe even touched on earlier. Oh, that was that was the idea I was getting at. Yes, I remembered. Um, earlier, I was talking about these paintings having a kind of glassy, jewel-like surface because they're on hard wood with thinly painted layers of glaze. Well, what I was getting at is, is that, that the whole process of working is kind of like uh, polishing a surface. I watched a video the other day on YouTube of a... Uh, guitar factory. It was the Rickenbacker Guitar Factory. They were showing how the guitars are made. It was very interesting. And uh, they talked, they showed the final stage, the polishing stage, and how they get a very, very fine, very high gloss, amazing finish. You know, and, and I was thinking about polishing and how you go from, you know, a rougher buffing rag or object, whatever, down through, or wheel, you know, down to the the finest, softest, hand-polished rag or whatever, you know. And that's kind of like the, the way that these paintings are produced, is it's, you go from general shapes, placeholders, then you add in this layer of, of detail, these little leaves and stems and things and it brings the whole thing to life you need that um, variety of scales you know sometimes you'll see like a cluster of weeds together like i said growing out of you know a crack in the sidewalk and you realize that it, you know the composition is what makes it so so cool is there'll be like you know this one weed that has a little tiny leaves that are all sharp and then next to one that has slightly bigger leaves that are all round and then there's another one that's sprouting straight up and it's got these kind of saw blade leaves and it's the combination of all those different sizes of leaves and the the friendly round ones next to the kind of jagged saw like ones that makes the composition uh, sing that that group of weeds And that's the kind of thing that you're looking for in painting compositions that I'm looking for when I do these imaginary um, images, these imagined images. And the kind of realism I'm, I'm shooting for is that kind of children's illustration book, Northern Renaissance um, you know, we're not going for hyper-realism or natural, you know, it's not meant to look like it's really that planned, but it's, but it is. See, not, not photographic, but it is, um, yeah, more in the realm of, you know, less, one step towards abstraction from, uh, you know, botanical illustration, I might say, something like that, that to put it on a gradient. All right, now we're down in the uh, lower left-hand side of the painting. Looking at these figures that are emerging from the mist. Love that kind of light effect. That's something I really want to keep working on and try and get some mastery over. Who are these figures? Where are they walking from? What are they walking into? I love painting little fi rough figures like that. Silhouettes, varying degrees of detail. Ways to push and pull, foreground, background. It's just all very satisfying, fun, and uh, yeah, just very pleasing to execute. And again, 
you know, I'll say this probably many, many times, but you know, there's no mistakes. There's no, you know, it's not like you have to do everything at the same time or whatever, you know, like I'll put in those, for instance, those leaves that, that are kind of like gold coins above where I'm working right there. Um, you know, and I might go back in and uh, do a little glaze of green over some of them, you know, to make them be, you know, catching light in a different way or a glaze of purple or a, a brown or something, a, an orange oxide, transparent orange oxide or something. You know, it just depends, whatever you want. Or it could be a, a light, a white, a, a, something like that. You know, but, but anywhere that it's, uh, you know, too kind of high key or whatever, you just bump it back later with a glaze. Again, a glaze being a thin, transparent layer of color. There I am working in a sort of, uh, putting those little details up there. There I'm working with a kind of opaque white, probably some titanium white, a little yellow of some kind. Put things in like that. You're going to bump them back later. Sorry about that glare, whatever. I'm using my liner brush there. That's a brush that's a very important one when doing this kind of work. It's, it's an essential brush, essential. The liner brush, they're sort of a long round brush. It's in the round brush of family. Come in different sizes and they're, you know, about twice as long as your typical round brush, maybe three times as long for and you can do lines with them. It holds a well of paint. So I, they're just essential for sort of the drawing aspect of this detail work, putting in highlights and things like that. When I do this kind of work too, I like to have a newer brush on hand. This is a cool figure that comes out of nowhere. I love just painting a figure like that and sort of trusting its... Uh, Um, uh, what do you call it? Gesture, you know, like this thing, like that one, I was like, oh my God, there you put in this crotch light and then suddenly it's just a person sort of doing a weird, like they're in some reverie, they're in some hallucinatory, like, you know, you don't want to necessarily, in a crowd like this, you don't want everybody to be having the same experience. This guy's in ecstasy. His head's kind of thrown back. He's walking away just in a dream. And then another person might be walking away just in a, you know, more of a, magic spell of some kind, I don't know, some other, they might be more surprised or whatever. Another one might be scared. But, uh, you know, you don't have to force figures like that or faces onto figures. And, you know, right there, right there, I started working on this thing and I was like, oh, it looks kind of like a hand that's running itself through the, through the water, but then I just erased it. I don't know why, you know, just, yeah. Maybe not. You know, one of my uh, um, things I have to do is is remind myself to, you don't have to put everything in every painting, you know. And I used to kind of have this holistic idea of like everything has to have everything in it. So just cram, you know, it's probably why I work on paintings for 15 or 20 years. There's another little person coming in, a purple person. What are those like bird people back there in the middle there between the two main figures? Kissing bird people, you know, and when that kind of thing appears, you, you also want to look at that and go, do I want to put that in there? Maybe that is something I should put in there, a bird. You know, it put itself in there. I should probably trust that, right? And sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. I like the scale. People back there, again, it doesn't matter if they're too dark or too light. You just push them back with some, you can do a, a, a transparent white wash over them, yellow, yellowish white, purplish white. Push and pull with different, you know, high, again, it's just highlights, washes of, not washes, glazes of uh, color playing with one another, pushing and pulling until you get 
something that's compelling. Here's a figure that I'm putting in the uh, foreground. I'm trying to establish this order of, of uh, things in space. That arm. You see, I just I wish that was more in uh, in line. I wish you could see it that all, but uh, yeah, just like putting in uh, a figure, then you kind of accent it with a background with light coming through. Try and push things as, as far as you can with each move too, you know, like, like, you know, if you're doing an arm and the hand sort of appears, then why not put the fingers too? just get it in there, you know, so that it's as close to established and, you know, you don't have to think about it and you just have to finish it. So this figure is in the, uh, and it looks, you know, it's an, okay. That's a perfect example too of a figure. Um, giving itself away like the way that woman in the forefront the way the blob of head that I uh, drew in there it's a nice shot the way the blob of hair of head rather you know appeared it looks like she's looking behind her to me maybe or she's looking forward or is she going to be looking down at the thing she's holding she's holding this kind of drip or a drop of light of some kind it's always a thing that's cool to do too is to put in you know like there's drops of sun in the background there where these figures are now lighter so we're going dark to light those figures are way back there in the light. These people are moving out of the light towards what? A bird man turned into a sculpture, it looks like, or something. I was thinking in this video that maybe I would have some musical interludes where I would just drop in a tune Maybe I will. Edges there. You see that edge of light on the back of that figure I just put in there? On the far left of the scene. Looking at that right now, you think, well, how much more powerful would those vines look if you if there were shadows cast by them on that brown furniture, you know, like that's a huge thing. And, you know, on vines like that, these blue vines or those yellow vines, you could go in there with a very fine brush and really give them, uh, uh, you know, th like two or three uh, levels of shading. You know, I like to think with shading, you do three three values the highlight the middle and the low and then you blend those two into about seven gradients of value if it's you know something that you want to get realistic you could be at many more but um you know if you're just like something like a vine two 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 blended uh, values is plenty Three is more than enough. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the modeling, like you look at a garden hose and you go, okay, there's the, there's the light on top, the, the gleam on top of the vinyl. There's another band of light and then there's might, might be a reflection off the sidewalk on the very bottom of the, the tube. But you can, you know, do a shadow that's just just a shadow alone on you know doesn't even need to be modeled it could just be the shadow and the, the object that's enough it plays you know, to the eye
trying to give this egg a glossy gel like more than glass it's it's gel it's a it's a fish egg kind of vibe or a, you know a cell sack and that's the kind of thing you know you can look at old masters you can look at science journals you can look at photos on the internet of you know whatever octopus eggs anything that's you know you just get in there do a bing search where you just bing bong around things in sacks in transparent sacks But I mean, Gardner Birthday Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, he's going to have pretty much everything in there, you know, wood, metal, well, not plastic, but, you know. Everything else probably has plastic in there. So much glare. Oh, my God. See, right there, I should have like something go going across, you know, some. Better looking image or something. OK, so I'm working on the background. Going back in there. Background foreground, how do you differentiate between the two values can be a way to do it atmospheric perspective, you know, scrims of white to imitate particulate matter in the air. It's called atmospheric perspective. I'm, I'm talking to you like you're not a painter, like you don't know, you know, this is for everybody and nobody. Distance can be described the illusion of distance can be created by darkness by light by hue shift hue being color value shifts value being darkness light I'm establishing depth there by putting in this reddish next to the green. So it's a complementary color, complementary being the opposite on the color wheel. I want to create a, sh a shadow for a yellow object? Try purple. You know, it's that simple. Purple's the opposite on the color wheel. Doesn't matter if it looks too chunky right now. Don't, you don't. That's nothing to you know concern yourself with when you're painting. You just go, yeah, I'll go back in. I'll glaze. I'll add highlights. Just the first pass. If it's not good yet, it's just not finished. You're, you're gonna work it till it's good. There, I'm adding depth depth with some red. Permanent carmine, perhaps. Doesn't matter if it's too red, it's gonna be bumped down, it'll be bumped up. Going in there lightening this brown. This is kind of a piece of furniture is what I want that to look like in the end. Might even put wood grain on there. See that shadow? I made that shadow with, by adding a higher value and keeping the darker value underneath. That's a neat way to go. You don't have to, you know, when you think of a shadow, you might think, well, you're painting darker onto it. That's the shadow. You go darker, well, no. Depending on how dark it is already, you might go lighter around that. Get to it that way, and then you have that whole other thing. That's a major thing to understand with, with oil painting. You know, you can't do that in watercolor because the white of the paper is the white, unless you're going over it with gouache. Gouache being an opaque watercolor. Opaque being non-transparent containing white, typically.
There's an opaque color for you. It's probably titanium white and some yellow. Again, doesn't matter if it's too high. It doesn't matter if it's too high value. You're just putting it in there. It's going to have a glaze over it. Yellow glaze, orange glaze, purple glaze. Who knows? Green. Could carry the green over from those leaves. In any given painting session, I might have, I don't know, five or six brushes in play, like in one of these. Like I said, I got those liner brushes. I often will break out. I, I, I tend to buy new brushes regularly, like on eBay. I'll go through a, you know, a month where I just check it every day, looking for lots of brushes. By, and I don't mean, I mean a lot of brushes. I mean people selling groups of brushes, lots of brushes. I look for lots of lots. I would buy lots of lots if I found lots of lots because you're going to use brushes some, you know, anyways, you're going to need them. I mean, for me, I look at brushes like guitar strings, you know, they just, you know, they sound different over time. You know, they're going to, it's not that it's worse when it's kind of dull and, you know, it's just different. And, and same with brushes, you know, there's brushes change and then they have different purposes when they're all splayed out and dry or whatever. But you know, when I'm doing this detail work on a uh, panel painting, it's nice to have a brand new soft brush with a really, you know, f firm edge or a, a brand new liner brush, you know, with a, f with a really nice tip and reservoir so that it just, you can just do like perfect little sharp lines. So I might bust out and on actually, I, Yesterday when I was doing this painting, I did do that. I busted out uh, like three new brushes, again, that I had bought on eBay. And I think I paid something like, I don't know, 20 bucks for like five brushes. And I mean, if you go to an art store and buy those, it would be easily, I'd say 50 bucks for what I got. So, you know, you spend the money now save to save later. I'm using my fine brushes on this kind of work. But then when I do washes, I will go in, you know, or glazes, um, cover over swaths, I'll go in with a softer, big brush. You got to have one of those too, you know. And also you can do glazes with brushes that aren't super soft, you know, if you don't want that look. If you want, you may, sometimes you look at, uh, it'll be surprising when you look at a Bruegel painting or something in real life and you see how rough some of the brush strokes are and how like, yeah, this isn't, you know, you don't, it, it's not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not trying to give the illusion that it's not a painted, you know, that that's, I guess, one of the hallmarks of my style of like realism, quote unquote, or, uh, you know, um, representational realism is that I'm just going for like, you know, I'm not trying to fool the eye into thinking they're not looking at paint. You know, it's not that kind of realism. I mean, these are painted flowers. These are painted leaves. You're looking at paint on a thing. But you forget about that because you're, because the imagery is interesting and evocative enough to bring out emotions instead of that just pure an analysis. But the pure, pure analysis is awesome too. And as a painter, I do it all the time. I mean, one of the great things about painting, um, representational painting uh, for me is you, that it helps me digest what I see in the world. I mean, it's crazy how many times I'll paint some weird object or sequence of, you know, objects in some fantastical, psychedelic looking, um, you know, scenario. And then I'll walk outside just in like a boring, you know, just a standard kind of neighborhood, you know. And I'll see all the objects that I painted, I'll be like, there's a tube like that one tube I did. There's the flower that does that same thing with the three, you know, branches or whatever. There's that saucer, you know, thing, some swing in a tree or something that looks just like a weird sphere that, or a, you know, saucer that I painted. 
it's like boom, boom, boom. There, there, there it is. You know, as far out as anything I paint is, it's just really the stuff of life. And when I see, you know, like this scenario of these people, you know, emerging from the light into darkness, I go, well, maybe that's us, you know? Maybe that speaks to something too in my environment, even though, you know, it's, it's symbolic. Kind of imagined fantasy realm. You know, to me, the fairy realm or whatever, the realm of the imagination, the psychedelic, you know, extra dimensional, the, the imagined, the dream scenarios. I mean, that's as real as anything else because it's real. It's happened in your life, you know, that, that strange thought or that, uh, you know, yeah, just dream that dream, like there, or, or, or the dream, you know, I've, actual nighttime dream that you have, like that's as much a part of your life as any other part of your life is, you know, like sitting and playing video games with your friends is not more real than some epic dream you had. You know what I mean? And to put that in the hierarchy like that, it's, it's crazy. I mean, they're at least as real as one another, right? But I would even say that some, you know, the kind of dreams I've had in my life, it's like, my God, there's nothing more intense. Nothing. Okay, there I am putting in shadows. I'm going in with this really red. I mean, it's way too red, right? It just stands out. You just looks like paint applied on top of this kind of soft, mottled, mottled, I should say. You know, you got this, you got this under this painting that's like a soft brushed blended kind of green and brown. Is that a watermelon too? Or is it more like a date or a fig or something? It's like, I'm not sure. But I'm going in and making this red shadow on the green, which is a solid choice. You know, you think red opposite on the color wheel a good shadow for it. it's still too intense you know it sits too high up on the the surface so I'll, I'll go and fix that but you know one of the things you're I'm, you're constantly doing working on a painting like this is you're um you know creating little lists in your mind like well i'll get back to that you know i don't need to do that. i don't need to do all of that right now sometimes you're just putting in things and going like okay that's gonna be worked in i just wanted to get that idea down though immediately so you you just rush in there and get 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 a kind of sloppy indication of uh, the idea, you know, just so that it's marked and ready to go. Because then I'll go back and I'll work that red later. Again, this isn't like a, these are just lists that come into your brain as you're working. I mean, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, and um, that's kind of one of the stages too of, uh, which brings me to the, the the stage of blending, which is something I, um, you, know, you do all the time. I'm blending right there with my finger, with my thumb. That's blending. You know, when you put in something and it just sits too, like I said, sits kind of too high up on the in the mix. You know, it needs to be pushed back. You know, you're constantly having a rag in your hand when you're oil painting. You know, at least I do. Um, hold a little piece of t-shirt in a gloved hand, you know, so you're not soaking in the, uh, the Gamsol, which is my solvent of choice. Always work with ventilation as well. Always run over things, smooth them out, make them so they're not, you know, you know, the, uh, level of realism 
or whatever you want to call it that I work in. Um, you, I try to avoid having the paint really announce itself as paint as much as possible. You know, I'm not trying to do like, I want to always go towards the softer, more realistic, more modeled look in general. You know, that's, that's kind of the way I skew like there, you see with those that what I was just doing, those highlights on that branch, I'm doing the upper highlight is a kind of purple highlight, a, a light purple. And then the bottom one is a yellow one. That's an exciting combo. Oops. Yeah. Sorry about that. Of course, right when I'm describing it, I move away from it. Oh, well, but you get what I'm saying. There's like a purple light highlight on top of that branch and a yellow under light. Those are both complementary colors, of course. What's happening? The color is going crazy. I don't know why I put this in there. I just changed the hue just for fun. I guess part of the reason why is because I wanted to get across the idea that color, that paintings change, you know, when you look at them, what light they're in, is it a reproduction? Is it a photograph? I mean, I think of some of the paintings that have influenced me more than any others I've never seen in real life. I've never seen, uh, Garden of Earthly Delights by Bosch, 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 Hieronymus Bosch. Never seen it. You know, so I'm looking at reproductions. Who knows how accurate this is? What does it look like in the afternoon? Is, is there daylight in that room? Foggy day, rainy day, sunny day. You know, how dirty are your glasses when you're looking at them, you know? I look at these paintings in all different kinds of light. I'll paint in half light. I'll paint with, you know, just one bank of my little, you know, clip on fluorescence. I'll have the bright light with the, you know, lighting umbrella on for a while. I'll do it just during the day. Daylight comes in the window. I want it to work in all those lights. There and putting some lanterns back there in this space, creating kind of more like a party than a you know alien ship or something, or old timey hanging lights. Who's that? Another people, smaller people, so we're pushing the depth back. It's going kind of flatter. It used to be kind of ascending, but now it's kind of, it was kind of going in the same direction as the table, but now it, it looks flatter than the table. There's a figure walking off in the distance with a, a, the highlight, a pink highlight. Put details on the shadowy figure in the front. See the brush moves all around. I'll take a I'll take a color. There's not it's not like you load the brush always with intention of where it's going. You load the brush and, and the the painting will tell you where it needs to go. You know, I can put pretty much any color that's on the palette at this point on my brush, and there's gonna be a plenty of places to apply it. There I am uh, creating Um, drawing around a character in light. There I am highlighting one of those coins. I just highlighted one of them. You see how much it sparkles? Even just there. Oops, my hand just covered it. But See that one that I just highlighted? That one coin? That's how powerful that is. It's one of the things with the, these paintings that's always surprising to me. I'll probably say this every time. But the detail, every little detail matters. It's crazy how much it does. Until you get that level of back and forth between the glazes and the highlights, it's just not going to sing the way you want it to. 
That's why it's like polishing. You know, you, you polish for a day, set it aside, come back tomorrow, polish again. Pull up the highlights, push them back, push the background back, bring the foreground forward. Oh, it looks like we're towards the end. Stay creative, stay engaged. The struggle is life, the struggle continues. Glad to be a temporal neighbor of yours. Trigger Method Oil Painting. <laughs>